those that are have joined us by live stream also. Those on live stream, we want you to know that we prayed for many of you tonight. And we're asking the Lord to help us to be used of him in, these, uh, in this type of prayer. Tonight we're going to be, since the 29th lesson in the book of Amos, we're going to be in Amos, the 5th chapter, verses 13 through 15. Now you'll learn from this text, and there are others like this, that the Lord not only assesses his people, I believe I made a point of this last time, but he apprises the people of their condition, whether it's good or bad. And sometimes he spells out various consequences of their conduct. Either it'll be a, if it's good conduct, he says, I'll keep you from the hour of tribulation that's coming upon the face of the whole earth. That's a, how about that? And if it was a, I'll spew you out of my mouth. If it was the other way, he'd tell them the consequences. The Lord's straight up with us, brethren. The Lord's straight up with us. Tells us what we are, what he is. And he even tells why the condition exists. Which was it going to do with the Israelites here? That's the divine manner. And the people of God are to be acquainted with it. That this is the way God is. There's a lot of folklore about God today. It's a... <laughs> It's amazing. I am utterly confounded at the level of ignorance that exists in the professed church about God. It is mind-boggling. Some people can't get one inch off the ground. And I know that the Lord, if I, <laughs> if I see it, I know the Lord sees it. And there's a reason for it all. <clears throat> I think people have been taught wrong about God almost 100%. I give a little leeway, maybe it'd be in a tenth. But they've been acquainted with a God that works in the context of human will and happenstance. It's the kind of God they've been taught. Well, it hasn't been in those words, but that's the conclusion they've come to. So you chart your own course, and you know there's all sorts of things that go along with that. But this universe and the people in it do not operate independently of God. They may not be able to see God in it, but he's, he's there monitoring it very carefully. There's a sense in which all this presentation about God is, I would call it hoopla, it's been clouded by a, beneath a cloud of human wisdom. People have learned to sound smart. <laughs> I'm religious people, I'm, I'm talking about religious people. They've learned to sound smart. And of course, when you're speaking to ignorant people, that's not hard to do. You really gotta pick up on this, really, because if you are fundamentally unacquainted with God, you're like available for this kind of delusion. Somehow religious people have come up with, they think this way, they don't think in these words, but they think that God really doesn't have to be the priority in your life. So, somehow people have this I can tell they do because they li they're living it out right under our nose. They're living without God being, having priority and preeminence. They're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. They got some other firsts that they're seeking. And all of this is a product of the way people understand God. When people are, all throughout history, when anybody, whether an individual or a group, was cognizant of the fact that God was there, 
like at Mount Sinai, a place like this, hey, none of them were casual, let me tell you. Most of them were frightened. Even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. He was a holy man. Now, here's the thing we want to focus on tonight. The Lord not only spells out the circumstances of a person, of an individual, of a, a group of people, of a nation, but these circumstances are governed by him. Amen. And if God puts up a blockade, you will not be able to go beyond it. It doesn't make any difference how smart you are or how hard you try. If he sticks up a barrier, you are not going to get by it. And if he doesn't, you can progress. Why? Because he's governing, see? He's governing the world. <clears throat> now, of old time, the prophets, Moses and the prophets, would tell people how to conduct themselves because they didn't know. So in that Sinai, Moses told him, hey, change your clothes. Wash your bodies. Husbands, don't come near your wives, not tonight. We're going to, see, they told the people what to do. Prophets would do that too. They tell the people what to do. Call for a fast. They tell them what to do. I think we have that kind of a situation today. It's, it's not... In a sense, what you tell is general, but then it gets down to some specifics, too. Like it says, seek the Lord. I mean, that's general, but <laughs> when you go to put it to use, something else. Yeah. Like they'll t they told him, Isaiah 55, 6, Isaiah told him, this is time to seek the Lord. Mm -hmm. See, now the times may not look like that. The times may look like, hey, well, things are going along really good. We're getting bumper crops, and nobody's attacked us, and... No, but you better see it's time to seek the Lord. Amen. Seek the Lord Amen. while he may be found. Amen. If you linger on this, wait long enough, when you start seeking, he may be, not be able to be found. Yeah, that's right. Ezekiel told the people when it was time to repent. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 14, 6. They were told when to pay close attention. Moses to listen to what God's God saying, he even told them when they should reason, come less reasons together, saith the Lord. See, he even told them this is the time to do some thinking with God. Think this, think this thing out with God. All this accents that man is absolutely accountable to God. See, this kind of instruction or speech tells you whether man knows it or not, he's accountable to God. Amen. And it may look like not submitting to God is passing by under the radar, so to speak. But the day of judgment, it's all going to come out. That's right. So that, uh, that's why it's necessary to judge yourselves. All right, tonight we're going to be dealing with some instruction that's similar to that. Amos 5, 13 through 15. <clears throat> he just got through telling that there was a they had manifold transgressions and mighty sins. What a, what a description. This wasn't a man that said this. This is God that said this. Manifold transgressions. It's kind of hard to count them up. There's so many different kinds of them and mighty sins that dominate. <clears throat> therefore, he says, therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil, love the good, establish, establish judgment in the gate. I, it, it may be that the God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant, not you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it may be yes. that the Lord God of hosts shall be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Yeah. Oh, 
He doesn't. So it's a scripture. We just read scripture there. And I'm going to prove to you tonight there's some people you can't really guarantee God's going to forgive them. You can admonish them to say, just, just maybe. Yes. Maybe he will. I don't know. Some people are going that far, you know. Thank God we don't have to decide who this is. This, yeah. this, we haven't been licensed to determine Amen. who this is. So don't, don't try f to figure it out because you'll figure wrong. Therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time. See, <clears throat> neither righteousness nor unrighteousness is static right. or just holds, holds a steady line all the time. Neither righteousness nor unrighteousness. They both have heights and depths. They have, both have peaks and they have valleys. There's some, sometimes when righteousness is very strong, sometimes iniquity is very strong. Sometimes righteousness is very weak. Iniquity is very strong. Ebbs and flows like that. This is proof that men are not governing the world. Because yes, man doesn't like change. If he could stop this up, down, he'd stop it. But yeah. see, he, yeah. he can't. That's right. Sometimes holiness prevails and wickedness prevails. It's, it's telling you yes. whoever's controlling the world is not us. Yes. The, the, the perception of how far sin will take you is never right. It may look like oh, yeah. it's only going it to, it's just, I'm just moving this far away. But what, what they fail to reason out is that doing that makes God your enemy. That's right. And now you've moved a lot further than you thought. Oh, amen. Amen. Let me comment briefly on the the dichotomy that's in the world, two, two different things that aren't static. They're both of them are going like this all the time. There are two gods. There's the only true God, and there's the God of the world. There are two laws. The law of sin and death, and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus competing there's two bodies of people the children of God the children of the devil there are two kind of prophets prophets God puts in the church and false prophets there's two gospels the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that has power and another gospel which is not another which has no power there are two powerful bodies of personalities. There's principalities and powers in heavenly places, and there's principalities and powers against which we wrestle. There are two kinds of spiritual messengers, holy angels and evil angels. The evil ones are aligned with the devil. Now, the presence of these factors is what makes life not static Amen. that's why life is variable because of these competing influences and personalities our text says therefore now the word points back to God saying this I see your man I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins so that you say he's going to draw a conclusion now yeah. based therefore is an unavoidable consequence of what you've done. Therefore, uh, be sure your sins will find you out. You will never be able to escape the consequences of sin or the rewards of righteousness. The circumstance he is addressing is a serious one. They've got sin, they're an overload of sin. So he makes this rather salient statement that is certainly conducive to a lot of thinking. The prudent shall keep silence at that time. 
Other versions say the prudent keep silence. New American Standard says that at such a time the prudent person keeps silent. Basic Bible English says the wise will say nothing at that time. God's Word Bible says that is why the wise person keeps silent. New American Bible says at this time the wise are struck dumb. Net Bible says whoever is smart keeps quiet. Living Bible says, therefore, those who are wise will not try to interfere with the Lord. English Revised Version said, the one perceiving in that time shall keep silence. The Message Bible says, so the understanding ones will keep silent in that time, and protest and rebuke are useless. Well, there's a lot to, <laughs> there's a lot there to consider. And it's, uh, the text is a little bit more broad, some versions suggest, but there's some truth in each of them. The prudent man, not just the prophet of God, because Amos is, Amos is speaking up. Yeah, uh -huh. but he's doing so because God told him to speak up. Right. Prophets after him did the same thing. They'd speak up in evil time. They'd speak up, even though others didn't. Here, as I understand it, the immediate meaning, but it's just an introductory meaning, is that the judges were unjust. They took bribery. That's what the preceding verse said. They took bribes, and it was pointless to present your case yeah. to the judge. Yeah. You just as well be quiet because it isn't going to work. So that's, that's the immediate. Some people think that's the totality of the text, but I, I don't think it's a totality. But, but that part's true. There are times yeah. when you know you sense this is not a proper judgment, but they're not going to do any good for me to say anything about it. And blessed is the man who, seeing that, doesn't say something about it. There are some people that are professional gripers. That's what they are. They're complaining about the state of the nation. They're complaining about this. But they, you should never complain about something you can't do anything about. That's kind of the bottom line of this. That. That's an elementary application, but it is true. This is why when Jesus stood before Pilate, he didn't say anything. Same principle, right? Because he knew Pilate. <laughs> yes. Plus the fact that he was there on a mission from God. Yes. It is written, when he was accused of the chief priests, he answered nothing. Yes. It's a prudent man. It's, he said, now this is not true. Pilate, you're telling a lie. See, this wasn't the time to say it, first of all, because of Pilate. Second of all, because he was there to lay down his life. So, so he, that was his case was a little bit different. Uh -huh. Paul, Paul did say about accusations against him later on. Yeah. To someone that was congenial. In fact, he, he said it because the man asked him to say it, remember? Uh -huh. You can speak for yourself. And when Pilate said, don't you, don't you realize the charges? Don't you hear the charges that have been made against you? And it's written, he never, he answered him to never a word. Now later Amos, in the same book, will present a case where injustice had been done. And when one made a request concerning the situation, this is Amos 6.10, Another responded, Hold thy tongue, for we may not mention of the, of the name of the Lord. It'd be like saying, Don't pray in Jesus' name. That's against the law. That happened back then. That happened. And Amos is saying there are times like that when it's, it's pointless. Let's see if we can develop this a little bit more. God said one time to Israel, what could, have, what could have been done more to my vineyard than I have done in it? All right, you're going to plead with me about the situation? Let's start by telling me what I could have, what I missed doing. Yeah. Now, some people would try. Oh, yeah. Some people would tell you, well, if the Lord had done this, this wouldn't happen. They would they, they'd take up the argument. See, a prudent man, when God talks like a prudent man, he, 
he backs off. He doesn't say, well, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Let me tell you, let me tell you, what, if, if you'd have done this, this wouldn't have happened. Well, if you love me so much, why did you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, he's talking about the Pharisees in particular to his disciples. Matthew 15, 14. And he said this, let them alone. This is Jesus said this. Mm -hmm. Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. Both of them are going to fall in the ditch. Just let them alone. Yeah. Don't try and correct them. Mm -hmm. be, so Jesus said this. Mm -hmm. They're beyond correction. Don't, don't be trying to straighten out the Pharisees. Let them alone. That's, see, a prudent man keeps silent, see. Right. Hosea records a word that's similar to the word of our text. In Hosea 4.4, 4. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are they that strive with the priest. It's just how bad it is. The most lofty representative of God, the people argue with him. But you, so you think you're going to present a, you think you're going to present an outstanding argument to them? If they won't listen to my representative, you think they're going to listen to you? See, it's a time to keep silence a prudent man. Keep silence. Amen. The idea is that these, the, this is an extreme situation. This isn't a normal. Uh -huh. See, every time you bump up against a wall, you don't cite this text. This is an extreme mm -hmm. situation. You may not like this, but there are some people that cannot be profited by the truth, and you're wasting your time when you sell it to them. Or shall we say throwing the pearls to the swine, or giving that which is holy to the dogs? Right. We see that prudent man. Put, this is a dog. I'm not going to give them something holy. This is a swine. I'm going to cast pearls here. See, a prudent man yes. sees this hate case and keeps alone. Now this. Um, this is something of what happened to the fornicator at Corinth. This is the approach that. Paul, so he finally told him, leave, leave this guy alone. Don't talk to him anymore. Don't pray for him. Don't admonish him. Kick him out. Yeah. He'd come to this point. Right. He'd be honest. That didn't mean nothing could be done. That just meant man couldn't do anything. Yeah, see, you got to see this. A prudent man knows I can't change the situation, so I better back off, stop trying to change it. But God then, that didn't, when this man was stuck out in a wilderness, so to speak, by himself, God did get through to him, and that man repented. But they could have talked to him for 10 years. He had never repented. It had never happened. Some people will never be turned around by going to church. They won't. They have to be deprived of every access to every Christian. And when that happens and there's nobody left, well, God has been known to break through to people like that. Yes. Corinthian fornicator, where he had to um, cast them out so that he could work with them alone. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. See, the, the, the church doesn't have all the answers. It has the gospel. But it doesn't have all the answers. It can't resolve it. I mean, you might establish a help group and all this and try and do. See, but this, there's some things only God can change. When a person's been sitting in a fellowship where God's working, and he did in Corinth, he did, and, he, and they go astray anyway, people ought to at least screw their heads on. And though we've already been ministering to this person for 5, 10, 15 years, all of a sudden, is our word going to obtain power? Because people who backslide did it in the presence of truth. That's right. yes. uh -huh. So they're not, they just didn't they wait to made a mistake. Mm -hmm. See, a prudent man foresees those kind of times and keeps silent. Are they yes. As you were talking, I couldn't help but consider in the book, The Screw Tape Letters, one of the attacks was to keep the man in the church. Don't let him leave the church to keep him away from the Lord. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. This is very difficult for some to receive, I know, but surely none of you. But if you are, just sit on it for a while and think about it. Because what I told you is the truth. Amen. Then, then the Lord accounts for why a prudent man is going to keep silent. He's not going to try and build a case, a, a spiritually logical case, and introduce it to a bunch of stone-dead people. He's not going to do that, not a prudent man. <clears throat> I made this mistake, thinking I could change somebody by good thinking. But there are some people who can't be changed by good thinking. God just got to force himself into their, into their life and make them so miserable, hedge their way up in thorns and make life so miserable. Finally, they call on the name of the Lord. That's how God, this, this is how it works. Now, a prudent man sees it. He can force these up. I'm going to have to put this in the hands of the Lord here. This is beyond. I say that because if you keep trying to do something you can't do, you'll get discouraged. And you may even doubt your faith. See? It'll beat you down. Eventually. Now the Lord accounts for why this kind of circumstance arises. It's an evil time. It's, a, it's an evil time. Iniquity had reached an epochal level. It's an evil time. Remember Paul said, you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, and having done all, to stand in the evil day. So this was an evil day. This, you had to have all armor on and be adept at using it just to hold your ground. That kind of a day. Isaiah said it during times like this, Isaiah 29, 21, he said, a man will become an offender for a word. Yes. Some of your closest friends become your enemies because of one sentence you said. Uh -huh. Now, some of you experienced this, haven't you? You've experienced this. That's an evil time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, unless directed by God otherwise, the prudent man keeps silence. There are days that are so evil and people that are so ignorant that the word of the Lord is, withdraw thyself. Yeah. Get away from that person. 1 mm -hmm. Timothy 6, 5. Or 2 Timothy 3, 5, turn away. That's, these are bad cases we're talking about. You don't want to do, this is not to be your first reaction when you face opposition. Those times are the times when the righteous gather together. There comes a time, I'm, i got to be careful how I say this, there are times where evangelizing is really not the main thing. The main thing is surviving. And if you survive, then you'll be able to go everywhere preaching the word. <laughs> but during these evil times, prudent man foresees evil. Doesn't speak, he doesn't speak, but he gathers with other right. prudent people. Amen. Build up one another in the faith. Now he has it, God doesn't end it there. If he just said that's all for to just go home now, we'd see that we'd have to try and work that all out and that'd be pretty pretty difficult. So he tells the people Yes, go ahead. The, the opposite of this might be like Paul going to Philippi and he finds Lydia. That's right. <laughs> uh -huh. He says the Lord opened her heart. That's right. That's the opposite of what he's That's talking right. about here. Amen. Amen. There are people. There are people that we'll, we cross paths with that, that that'll be the case. Amen. It may not be like a whole lot of them, but you know, it may, may just be may just be a few women down by the by the river river there. Yeah. But it almost seems to me that Jesus own ministry. Yes. Place during a time like this. That's right. He, he had said, opposition everywhere he turned. Yeah, but he said, like whom shall I like in this yeah. generation? And, and, and even those who at first appeared to listen, after a while, yeah. this is a hard saying. That's yeah. right. And they turned away. The Lord quit and talking. All he to had them. was just, just those twelve. Yeah. yeah and after and that, one of them was a devil. The Lord didn't seek him down. Yeah. Him down and yeah. That's right. Again. That's right. Now what the what the institutional church actually does 
is if people won't listen, they say, well, we got to change our message. That's right. Uh -huh. You're right. we got to say something else uh -huh. so that they'll come and, I guess, tithe or whatever. Yeah. This is what he would call here, take a bribe. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a dumbed-down judge taking a bribe, uh -huh. except it's down at more of a simple level, but it's the same same principle. I can get a better advantage if I don't address this situation. But they change their methodology, and they end up changing their method message, even if they didn't intend yeah. to. But sometimes they do intend to change the message. Um, yes, you know, I, know, I do from think hellfire brimstone to friendly friendly secret. Yeah, that's a, a that's a second resort because they finally find out you. I can't just preach the message. Yeah. I, it's not being received, so I'll I'll reshape how I present it, which yeah. boils down to you don't present it. <laughs> Now, it may appear at this point pointless to give an admonition to someone who's caught up in the evil day. But now we're dealing with God, who can, he can do things like this. So he's going to speak to them. Jesus spoke in this manner to the sinful churches of Revelation. He told them what to do. you gotta, you got to make a purchase from me. And we told, told Laodicea. So here's his word, seek good. Hmm, that's a short admonition. I think there are probably relatively few people in our generation that really could expound very much on what that means. Seek good. Basic Bible language says go after good. That is, it's like good's like on the move. Good's like on the move, moving away from you. If you don't, you, it's not just always under your nose. Actually, you're moving away from it if you want to get technical about it. So go after it while it's within sight. Search for good. Another version says, do what's good. The New Living Translation says. But what does it mean to seek? What, what, what's that mean? Well, if you want to look at it from just a strict lexical viewpoint, to seek is to resort to, seek, seek with care, inquire, require, resort to, consult. In other words, you do everything in your power to get hold of good. That, that's what that's what he's saying. Seek good. Seek to get a, oh, seek good in the sense that you end up doing good. See, seek good. Not a casual word. But it's particularly when one is living in an evil day, you gotta seek. But an evil day has like a dampening effect. You surely have experienced this. The evil day has a the first thing you know, the person subduing, doing less, saying less, being less, has a dampening effect. Can't can't let it have that. Seeking has a is a focused quest. It's just not. I'm looking for something. I just don't know what it is. It's not that. It, you know what you're looking for. Good. And sometimes you'll find it in pretty strange places. And seeking, I think, involves fervency and consistency and determination and zeal. Jesus made this promise, Luke 11, 9, it's found in Matthew 7, 7 also, and all they who seek find. Amen. Now, that's the promise now. So if, if a person hasn't found, they haven't been seeking. Amen. That's, what the, that's what the problem is. They've been seeking. First, I've been seeking the truth for 25 years. You just look right at them in the eye and say, you probably lie about other things too. You haven't been seeking the truth because Jesus said if you seek it, you'll find it. Right. Why will you find it? Because God honors a seeker. Amen. See, God's governing the show. That's what I, when I started out, that's why I said God's governing the situation. So if a person is seeking, everything may look like it's against him, but he'll, he'll find it. God will see to it. He finds it even if he's on a desert road headed over to Ethiopia. He'll find it. Amen. Yeah, Brother Judah. Seeking is the road to finding. Mm -hmm. The only reason you ever seek for anything is if you want to find something. That's right. The same as asking is the road to receiving, and knocking presumes that you want the door open. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if, if God knows, which he does, if he knows that you are honestly seeking the truth, he will give it to you. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Amen.
Divine power undergirds this. Now, on an evil day, seekers are rare. That's why we have an evil day. <laughs> That's why evil days exist, because seekers are few and far between. When seekers begin to reduce, evil begins to expand. Remember I always said that we're not in a neutral world. You've got these competing influences ranging from God down to angels, and they're competing against each other. So if a person's not seeking, evil expands. That's why people that fall away from the Lord, all of a sudden, they boom, they drop, they drop down to the bottom, and it's astounding. You say, what happened? When they quit seeking, the door flung wide open. For iniquity. It's the way the world is. Now let's look at what he said to seek. Seek. Seek good. Hmm. Now, of course, by nature, very nature, something good is better in quality. We understand. God is called good. Only God is good. Matthew 19:17. There's such a thing as a good conscience. See, I'm, so, I'm trying to expand now this field of what good is. The law is described as good, Romans 7, 13. God's will is good, the good and acceptable, the perfect will of God. There are good manners. Evil communications corrupt good manners. There are good works. We are ordained unto good works. There's good hope, good warfare, good behavior. Good fight of faith, good confession, good soldier, good fidelity, good conversation, good fruit. See, seek good. <laughs> that shows you what a, what a big tree this is. Yeah, amen. A lot of things on it. Seek good. The realm of good is vast. You are in a big, if you talk about agriculture, you're in a big field. Yeah. Uh -huh. Talking about trees, you're in a big tree. Mm -hmm. It's vast. Seek good. You'll not run out of things if you're seeking good. And, of course, to seek good, you've got to prefer good and want good, and, you know, all that goes along with this. Good things have a quality that sanctifies those who possess them. When you have something good, it exudes like a sanctifying power Amen. Yeah. over your life because it's good. It has divine properties, yes. Brother, the list that you just gave us makes it clear that the Lord Himself is the one who defines what is good. That's right. That's so right. Talking about human standards, a lot of folk, especially in our generation, in our country, good doesn't rise any higher than yeah. clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, yeah. and housing the homeless. Yeah. And that's as far as it goes. That's right. If you've done that, mm. but these things that you've listed here from Scripture, yeah, mm. reach right. into the heart. Amen. And, and, and Amen. the heart for all kinds of things. Yeah. Amen. As you said, mainly for things that are everlasting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've never heard any of these things mentioned at a secret friendly service. Have you? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> you know, I haven't either. <laughs> now, boy, let's boy, I'll say it this way. But to seek something, to seek good, you have got to rise above your generation. Yes. Amen. Because your generation, natural generation, they're not seeking good. That's why they're not finding it. So, so to seek good, you, you have to be like be non worldly. Amen. Amen. You have to separate. Uh -huh. Amen. Just to seek, you have mm -hmm. to do this. Yeah. Then, of course, they, they, God's already said if you seek, you'll find. Mm -hmm. And seek good, don't seek evil. That's not mm -hmm. evil. He's got to say that because of the flesh. See, oh, good, yeah. not evil. Uh -huh. Something evil is bad, wicked, disagreeable, malignant, gives pain, unhappiness, displeasing. There's a whole host of things. Which there, is different. This is different than saying make sure that the good that you seek outweighs the evil. That uh, that's you right. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Has to be a glaring contrast, yeah. Think of this, there's um, a person can have an evil eye. Yes. Matthew, <laughs> Matthew 6, 23. 
There's evil fruit. Matthew 7, 17. Evil speaking. Matthew 12, 34. Evil and adulterous generation. Matthew 12, 39. And evil servant. Matthew 24, 48. Evil deeds. John 3, 19. Minds that have been, quote, evil affected. Acts 14, 2. Evil deeds, or evil communications, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. And evil report, 2 Corinthians 6, 8. This present evil world, Galatians 1, 4. The evil day, Ephesians 6, 13. Evil surmisings. Surmisings are a notion or a conclusion based on scanty evidence. An evil heart of unbelief, an evil conscience. See, nothing in that orbit of evil is to be sought or desired or valued. You should not be intrigued by it. You should not engage in an effort to know more about it. See, that's not evil. And remember, Satan, evil always comes with a beautiful dress. It's like a beautiful maiden with a beautiful dress, well-formed. That's how evil comes to you. Whatever a person is seeking for actually reveals what spirit is right. in them. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Seek good, not evil. Why? Well, because this is what you ought to do. Well, that's what he says. That you may live. Amen. So seeking good, not seeking evil, just not a legal technicality. So you can live. That's live toward God. Israel should have, should have deduced from the law that they should seek evil and I uh, seek good, good and not evil. I mean, you should be able to really conclude that from, from the law. But, but they didn't. Amos tells Israel, you must seek good and not evil. Here's what God, here's what God told Israel back at the beginning. Deuteronomy. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and to the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live. And go in and possess the land which the Lord God your fathers giveth you, that you may live. The issue is whether you live. That's the issue. Not live in the flesh, live toward God. That's the issue. Are you alive to God? Amen. Can you hear God? Yeah. Can you sense God? Do you know God? See, that's the issue. In the New Covenant, we would say live unto God. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, that would be that would be a, a seek that you might live, be live unto God. As to practicality, the just shall live by faith. See, yeah. so that's uh -huh. see you, you, you get further with this in the new covenant. Right. Um, now this is life that involves seeking and doing good and not evil. Now, what is it? He adds something to this. So, it's if you seek good, not evil. So, the Lord shall be with you. Boy, that's a, of course, if you don't know God, this doesn't mean a whole lot. But if you do, this means a lot. Other versions read the Lord of armies, or the God of heavenly forces, or the Lord God Almighty. Or the God who commands forces will be your helper. The idea is God can do something about anything. Yeah. Amen. There are no limits with God. Uh -huh. He can do something about anything. Amen. Whether it's a blessing or whether it's a cursing, that's, that's his prerogative. The continued pre presence of God, I'll be with you, I'll be with you, see the continued presence of God is contingent on the preferences of the people. That's, what, that's just exactly what you yeah. said earlier. Uh -huh. Whether God stays with us or not is determined by what we seek, Amen. what we want, yes. what has the priority mm -hmm. in our life. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you that. Uh, now, let's state it in New Covenant language. Let's say the same thing in New Covenant language. Yeah. <clears throat> Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive. This is said to the church. Now, this is said to the church, right? And I will receive you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 
That's the New Covenant way of saying it. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> it, it, it's the circumference of it just as large, but it's the same thing. Absolutely. But I always seek the good stuff. Yeah. But then why do you need the exhortation? That's right. Because you're here, right here. You're in this body that needs these kinds of things. You know, when you think about this, this Second Corinthians six fifteen to eighteen. When you think about this, he says to the to the the church at Corinth. You got to separate. Yes, yes. And you can't touch the unclean thing. And until you do that, I'm not going to receive you. Yes. That's what that means. Because uh -huh. yeah. he says, and I'll receive you, which means if you don't do that, all right, now you trans transfer that over to today. Uh, you know that I've seen this. Maybe you participated in yourself where you didn't separate. You were touching the unclean thing. Mm -hmm. When it comes home to you, God will not receive you in that state. Uh -huh. Even though you were baptized into yeah. Christ, put on Christ, mm -hmm. placed in the body of Christ, all that, made a new creation in Christ, all that happened to the Corinthians, brethren. All that happened to the Corinthians. Right. Yeah. God established this principle in, in the, under the old covenant was telling them what was clean and what was unclean mm -hmm. and that they'd be unclean till even and they had to wash and that you know, there was there was a process of being cleansed yeah. from having come into contact with what was unclean that's how sensitive God is about this now we see uh Actually, people are not even aware of what's clean and unclean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that doesn't make any difference because under the law, if you did it and you weren't aware of it, you were still unclean. Still unclean. Yeah. So the contact with it, allowing yourself to come in contact, that's why you have to separate yourself. Mm -hmm. You cannot be clean as long as you make contact with what is unclean. Amen. And we've gotten so far, and we're coming up on a season that's like notorious for this. But I've noticed that uh, there's a there's a lot of interest, intrigue, attraction to things that are spiritually filthy, just filthy, dead stuff. And it, it just it, it, what is dead makes you unclean. Amen. Amen. Now that he says, uh, you seek the good, not the evil, that you may live, and then I'll be with you. And then he adds, as ye have spoken. In other words, it said, just as you say he is. The idea is you're saying I'm with you, but I'm not. Uh -huh. yeah. That's what he's. Yeah. We're like a. New Testament church. Hmm? Well, there's all kind of claims made in the name of Christ that are false, completely false. I'm saved. God loves me. God received me. May not be the case at all. Jazz said, if you want that, what you've been saying, what you've been saying, that God's with you, you seek the good, not the evil. And when you come alive, then I'll be with you. Just then what you say will be true. Until then, it's not. See, they, you, you see what they were boasting. In the yes. Paul touched that and boast us if thou art a Jew there in Romans 2. Uh -huh. Made a boast. Yeah. Where they were doing the same thing the Gentiles, they condemned were. So the need for today that parallels in this here is having therefore, beloved, these promises, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's 2 Corinthians 7 1. That's a new covenant statement of the thing that's said in this text here. Now, it isn't in there. Seek the, but just once you seek the good, not the evil, you're not done. You're not done. Some more things have to be done. Hate the evil and love the good. See, he's warning out that I'm just talking about a beginning. Seeking is a beginning. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Remember the first time he said, seek the good at first. Seek the good, hate evil. Say, but here he starts out with evil. Hate the evil. See? <laughs> yeah. He starts out with that first. See, it's not enough to cease seeking evil. This is a consistent requirement of those identified with God, this thing of hating evil. Psalm 34, 14. Depart from evil. Psalm 97, 10. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Romans 12, 9. Abhor that which is evil. 1 Peter 3, 10 and 11. For, the, for him, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil. Yeah. Loathe it. The psalmist said, I hate, I hate the work of them that turn aside. I hate every false way. I hate an abhor line. And it said of Jesus, God commended Jesus by saying, thou hast hated iniquity. Yes, See? Right. Hate iniquity. Well, uh, do you hate iniquity? I mean, you've got to ask yourself this question. Do I hate iniquity? And if I say yes, how do I know I hate iniquity? When you know you hate iniquity, it's a great boost to your heart. <laughs> when you recognize, all of a sudden, there's certain things that offend you. They're offensive to you. They hurt. It's like barbs that hurt. When that happens, this is a great consolation. Now, this is a, let's state this hate evil. Let's state this in a new covenant way where it says love the good. But we're at to love the good. Love the good. Let's look, first of all, some expressions of a man of God on this subject. He said, uh, I love thy testimonies, Psalm 119, 119. I love thy commandments, Psalm 119, 127. I love thy precepts, Psalm 119, 159. I love them, that's God's testimony, Psalm 119, 167. So that's a confession lived back under the old covenant of someone that actually yes. did this. Now let's state this in a new covenant way. Love the good. Love the good. Cleave to that which is good. That's, that's how you say it in Christ. That's just Romans 12, 9. That's a, that's a little bit. Yes. Anyone who loves good, this is what they have. But see, this, he begins to point out the traits mm -hmm. of this love. Cleave to that which is good. Whatsoever is good of re good report, think on these things. See, that's, that's what it means to yes. love the good. Or the love of the truth. Hold fast that which is good. Unfeigned love of the brethren and the love of God. See, this, it gets more specific. In the New Covenant, it gets more specific. It's, yeah. it's not as big as it is under the law. Yeah. Love for what is good yields a delight and an involvement in it. When you love what's good, you, oh, it's Amen. enjoyable and you want to be part of, you want to be part of it. Amen. Involved in it. <coughs> yes. It's been given a, a, a new capacity, a new heart, and a new That's way right. of expressing That's this. That's right. Yeah. See, when you love, when you love something, you prefer it. Yes, amen. You can imagine a husband saying to wife, "Oh, I love you, honey, but I'm going to live over across town. It's all right with you." That's how some people treat God. Oh, I love the Lord, but I've got a lot of stuff I got to do. You got to understand, Lord, I'm a busy man. Got a lot of responsibilities. These are things every person has to work out for themselves. Men don't think this way. They'll. Here's how men will talk. They'll say, "That's not so bad." The Bible doesn't say you can't do that. It's better to say, that's good. Yeah. You see the, <laughs> see the difference? See the difference between the two? Well, that's not, that's not so bad. There's no law against that. Or saying, now that's good. Huh. Seek the good. Yeah. 
and establish judgment. Establish justice or maintain justice. Yes. Before you move on from that point, I was considering some in our generation that have actually been deceived into thinking it's good to expose yourself to evil to, quote, know your enemy. Oh, yeah. So they're Very actually good deceived point. into thinking that exposure to evil is a good thing. Yeah. But evil is entangling. That's right. And it entices well, hey, to the part of you that is, that is not regenerated. That's why there's a danger in exposing yourself to it. Amen. That's a good statement. Evil is entangling. I'm going to add that to my vocabulary. Evil, evil is entangling. That's why people think it's an advantage to doubt. Yes. Yeah. Yes, faith, it's the beginning of faith, some, some think, yeah. So, what, you mean, you're not saying, surely, that if we're attacked by the Muslims, we hold some classes on the Quran and read and find out how they think. Okay, I didn't think you were saying that. But some people do, you know. You couldn't do that if you hated evil and love good. Establish judgment now. Get to the point where you can make proper determinations, proper conclusions. Now, there's a lot of um, flawed judgment in uh, the churches and Christian institutions of our time. Too often they hire and fire the wrong people. <laughs> they make wrong judgments. This is an all time low during Amos Day. The poor were unfairly taxed, they had the least tax of the most. A godly man has made an offender for just for saying a right word. Justice, Isaiah 59, 14, justice stood afar off. They were, see, their, their hearts, you got to see this, their hearts were so corrupt, justice couldn't enter into their activities. They were too corrupt. Flawed judgments also found, as I said, in the modern church. Now then, he says this final word. Seek good, not evil. Love, uh, hate evil, love good, establish judgment. It may be. Uh, it may be. That God will be gracious. It, some people could not even say those words. It, it may be. All right, we'll translate it to more modern English. Perhaps. Right. Didn't that kind of cause a tremor, tremor in your soul? It may be. No guarantee God will spare them, even if they manage to seek good and hate evil. Even if they manage to hate evil, love good, and establish judgment. Even after they've done that, maybe, maybe, maybe. After you've done that, maybe. Maybe the Lord will be gracious to you. Well, he even qualifies that. He doesn't say he'll be gracious to you. He says he'll be gracious unto the remnant. Yes. Is that what it says? Yes. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant. Yes. Unto the remnant yes. of Joseph. Hmm. You know, the, uh, Simon the sorcerer that... Peter confronted he wanted to buy the power to confer the Holy Spirit and Peter said well you don't have part or lot in this matter your money perished with you we said your money go to hell with you he said you pray to God it may be maybe maybe but God will forgive you this is so serious what you have done Peter couldn't guarantee that God would forgive him he said it may you read it for yourself Acts 8.22, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. See, all sin is not the same. Amen. Paul pre presents the same argument in dealing with a person who's an opponent. He said that you, and he's been dealt with gently. 
You deal gently with those that oppose themselves. Deal gently with them. If peradventure, that's the same word perhaps, maybe. If peradventure, I will, uh, God will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. It just maybe, 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 maybe. You say, well, I don't know if I can live with that. Well, sometimes you do have to live with things like this. There's some people you don't know. They're so, they're so bad, you don't know. They've descended so far down on the moral scale, you don't know. Yeah. That doesn't mean you give up. It just means you don't know. Yeah. Uh-huh. There are some cases you know. If thou wilt, he will. You know, there are some things. Mm-hmm. Yes. The danger of becoming dull of hearing, because Paul, Paul, yeah. um, he did write to the Hebrews. You said, you spoke of uh, moving on to perfection. He said, this we will do if God permit. If God permit. There it is again. There it is again. Be merciful to the remnant. It just may be that a church like Sardis that had a name, they were alive and they were dead. I said they were dead. That's what Jesus said. That was Jesus' evaluation. You're dead. But he said, I have some in Sardis that haven't defiled their garment. They'll walk with me in white. That's, that was the remnant. God had mercy on the remnant. Oh, you got to see this. I hope I can say this like I want to say it. There are some churches that are spared for the remnant's sake. Not for the church's sake. Not for the master of the people's sake. Spared for the remnant's sake. When Catholicism arose and captured the church, institutionalized it and captured it, God had mercy on the remnant, yes. and the truth survived that yes. situation. Amen. Right. When the age of reason come around and people kick God out, mm-hmm. and if you look in your hymn books, oh, you'll, you'll be confound you how many hymns are written in the 1800s. Have any of you ever noticed that? Yeah. Phenomenal number of hymns were written during the 1800s, which the age of reason was at its peak, and so God, the, the remnant were the singers and the poets. <laughs> and God had mercy and kept the truth alive. See, when God brings the sickle down, he can, he can forestall some judgments in the interest of the remnant. Not going to wipe the remnant out. Maybe that's what's happening in our day. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe this is exactly what's happening in our day. There's a handful of people have been seeking, relatively speaking. There's a handful of people have been seeking the Lord. They've been seeking good and hating evil and, and not evil, hating evil, establishing justice. And they're surviving. Yeah. Why? God's honoring the remnant. Yes, amen. He's having grace on the remnant because there's people... There's a whole host of people sitting right there with the remnant. They're not getting it. Mm-hmm. That's what's happening in this text here. Why does God save a remnant? Because he's dealing with the people that he called and sanctified. And even if there are whole generations of those people that are lost, God's going to be justified in his saying. He's going to bring a remnant through the fire. The prophet said he'd save a tenth part of them. Well, that's some th- add some things uh, to be considered in that text. It's uh, take that last statement. It still intrigues me. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will have graces will be gracious unto the remnant. That teaches us be remnant minded. God's remnant minded. It's easy to. Well, I say it's easy. It's easier, I think, to focus on the disobedient people and let them kind of capture your your attention. It, it's easy because they're so dominant. Do like God does. Focus on the remnant. Amen. Amen. And look, look for them. Look, look for a remnant. Look for the remnant. They're out there. Yeah. 
Some of us have found them. We know right. we know there. We found them in unlikely places. There's a remnant. There's one of the remnant there. Amen. God had grace on the people yes. because of the remnant. He had mercy on the remnant. Amen. Any of you have something you'd like to add, Brother Rick? The reality of this is that once a person has been delivered from sin by the Lord and they go back into it, there's no guarantee they can recover, and God is the only one that can grant them repentance to that's recover. Right. So that, that's up to the Lord to decide whether he wants to extend that mercy or not. That's so right. That's how serious that is. You're right, though. Yeah. Brother Jason. Yeah, on this, in that same vein, going back to connecting this, uh, this last part, God maybe that God will be gracious to connect that to the previous word there mm -hmm. if if a person or a nation or a body of people get into a spiritual state where they can no longer recognize or discern the mm -hmm. difference between good and evil that's an indication that they're in a state where their recovery is not guaranteed that's good. Mm -hmm. in fact that's good. it may be that behind that is what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, that that's God right. has given them over. That's right. right. Yes. You're right. That's mm -hmm. right. You're right. Amen. Now, if you're, if you're part of the remnant and you know it, now it becomes miraculous that you've survived. Yeah. Right. Amen. It, was, it was a great work of God to get you out of the world in the first place. Amen. But it... He, it's a great work to have kept you in this kind of generation. Amen. Anyone else tonight? That, final, that last word there also is a good indicator of the depth to which repentance has to occur oh, that's for good. forgiveness to take that's place. Good. And for one who is the remnant, those words, maybe... That would alert the heart. Yes, amen. The true rem remnant wants that forgiveness, wants to be clean. Mm -hmm. To one who is not seeking that, there will be an apathy that will be detrimental. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I could guarantee this. If you can get to Jesus, you'll be all right. Right? Come on to me. You, all you, so if you can make if you can make your way to Jesus and get there. Amen. Boy, that's a precious promise. Amen. And sometimes now, I'll have to admit, sometimes about all you can do is just get there. Right. You have to take all your energies just to get to Jesus. But when you get there, it says you'll find rest. I'll give you rest in your soul. All right. Very, very good, brother. Our Heavenly Father, <laughs> we thank you for uh, Brother Amos. We recognize the boldness, the stamina, and the faith it took to minister to the kind of generation he did. We thank you for him, and he's ministering to us, too, and laying up, uh, laying up a reward in heaven. We pray, Father, that we will never be the occasion of displeasure before you. In Jesus' name, amen.